Thanks for coming along to the session. I hope that from what I present here today, you'll find at least one or two nuggets to be able to help make a great success of your freelance business. I'm sure some of the recommendations are ones that you will have heard before, but I'm also hopeful that there might be one or two items that you can work on. But I can, in all full disclosure, say that I could have subtitled this talk, The Things I Knew I Should Take Care Of or Wish I'd Done Sooner to Build My Business. We're basically taking the learn from my mistakes route today. The job I had before I went freelancing was looking after this website for a large church which had a custom CMS built in ASP. And I was in charge of basically maintaining and updating the site. I was getting paid $36,000 a year for, which as you might be able to imagine was a little bit difficult to live on in Sydney. So in 2005 I started a little business on the side to do development for hire. Uh, that little business became a full-time thing in 2009 when all the other avenues for income that I had expected to kick in when I left that job to go to university uh, didn't actually happen. So without that expected income, I found myself having to freelance or starve and that made for an incredibly difficult year, having to work full-time to support full-time study. I slept very little. I had months when I wasn't completely sure if I was going to make rent and months when I had friends giving me grocery money just to make sure that I didn't actually starve. I finished out that year sick, stressed and tired, but I was solvent. So lesson number one is actually before you get into this freelancing business, have a plan. Um, work out how you're actually going to manage to get your business um, up to speed. And bear in mind that even working part-time at something else to keep you solvent while you're actually getting on, on the ball might be a good idea. And if you are jumping in free time, it'd be a really good idea to have some money behind you. Um, needless to say, I did neither of those things. Um, and it would have been a lot less stressful if I had. The thing is, is that if I had done that, I might not have ended up freelancing after all and taken the safe option. So I'm not complaining, but it was, you know, one hell of a lesson. Uh, this is the website for my little business. Um, you can also tell why I don't do design. Um, Uh, in my first six months in business full-time, I earned $9,000. I had some financial support from my dad, some cash in hand from a babysitting gig, and a credit card, but we're not going to talk about that. So if we look a little beyond that first six months, in that first full financial year of freelancing, I earned a gross income of 45 k and you can see a steady increase in the years that followed. Uh, to date, the work that I've been doing is uh, WordPress for hire, either at an hourly rate or at a contract rate. And while there's been some kind of hosting sales and recurring income from client maintenance plans, the bulk of this work is contract work. So in the next 15 minutes, I want to take you through some of the structures that I've put in place in my business that have helped me get that kind of growth in the last few years. These factors are managing your space, are managing your time, looking after your well-being, minding your business, and taking care of your professional development. So let's talk about your space. Initially, at its most practical, I'm talking about your workspace. So the first question is, where are you working? Where are you going to work? Are you working from home? Are you working from an office? Are you co-working? Or are you working in a cafe? I'm going to focus mostly talking to those of us who are actually working from home, as I suspect that that's certainly in those early years uh, what we do. It certainly helps not having to pay rent for an office. But Two of the most challenging things to get used to when you're working from home is keeping a line between your work life and your home life and the difficulty of keeping focused when you're actually in, at home where there's so many other things that you could be doing. Now, when I first started out, I was really lucky to have a connection with a friend who had his own agency. Um, he gave me free desk space, so I went to work every day in his office and in return, he got a cut rate on my hours and I got to work on some really cool client projects but um, I realised that not everybody's that lucky. But the best part about that was I went to work every day. Got up, got dressed, went to work. And I came home and then when coming home, it was relaxing time. It was a lot easier. Work stayed at work, home stayed at home. But if my best suggestion is if you are working from home, dedicate a place where you do your work. Have a dedicated workspace. Nowadays, I'm working from home, but I'm lucky. I have a really nice office. I can close the door on at the end of the day. And I recently bought a new TV, so now I'm not even spending all my time watching TV on my computer monitor. I actually get to live in my living room, which is quite nice. 
Um, secondly, in terms of focus, it's been really helpful to set aside this work area. It isn't always practical when you're starting out. You've got limited cash, you might not even have enough money to set up a desk. Uh, you might have to work from the kitchen table, but in those early months, prioritise managing your space and keep in mind the importance of being able to walk away from your work at times. And if you're finding that really difficult to get focused, maybe think about a couple of days a week in a co-working space just to kind of get your head into that zone. So the second spatial consideration around working from home or working for yourself is your headspace. And this one's a no-brainer for me, um, but it's something that I hear a lot of freelancers don't always manage to do. Dressing for work. When you're dressed for work, it changes your mindset and sets you up to achieve more or better results during the day. And you're taking this work seriously. I won't lie, there have been days I've worked from my bed, but um, I wouldn't call those my most productive days. Okay, I can confess I'm crap at this. Um, I've been trying to finish the day the, by tidying up my desk so that when I start in the morning I can um, get used to it with a clear head. So this is, my, this is the one I'm working on for the next few weeks. Um, it's just a lot easier not to be distracted by the mess. But, you know, I'll work on it. We'll get there. <coughs> Seriously, if you can get hold of this one, it's a lot harder to get into your bed and have a nap. It makes a huge difference to climb into it at the end of the day. And if you've achieved nothing else at the end of the day, at least you've got this. I love my office, it has a great look, outlook on the garden, a beautiful bustling street beyond, the tram live in Melbourne now, the trams go up and down. I have a pet for company and a whole lot of friends that I chat to inside my computer. But one of the best things for my headspace has been to occasionally go out and co-work with friends. We'll head to a cafe or a co-working space and just hang out and work in between our chats and generally get out of the home office for a change of scene. So one of the next big challenges of freelancing is watching the week disappear without having necessarily made any of the great achievements that you wanted to at the beginning of the week. So our next thing that we're going to talk about is um, how you can perhaps get some of that time back or focus some of your time. Set your alarm. Get up. Go to work. Realistically, you're an, op an entrepreneur. You have the power to work when you want, and the muse can hit you at any time. You're building something, and if it's going to be detrimental to your relationships, and if it isn't going to be detrimental to your relationships and family, just follow the muse and go with it. But for the sake of maintaining your sanity, make sure your clients understand you have office hours and you're not available outside of that. Start the week with a plan what you're going to achieve. Get into some routines and set specific times for regular tasks like invoicing, marketing, connecting with clients. You might not achieve them all, but in setting some goals and shooting for them will actually help prevent you from losing focus and forgetting what it is you're meant to be doing. And I don't know how many of you do this, but you open up a tab, you've got a thing that you're going to do, you get a message, you get distracted, and you come back an hour later and go, oh, that's tabs open because I was going to do a thing. <laughs> I don't know, crickets, it happens to me all the time. <coughs> Having goals and helping achieve them is actually incredibly motivating. So if you can get into that habit, it'll really pay off in the long term. This one's a doozy. Uh, I currently have to track all my hours for the client that I'm working for, and I'm finding it an incredibly good habit to be in. But it's also difficult to do if you're not accountable to anyone but to a single client. So it's a crazy important thing when you're you know, charging somebody hourly rates to keep accurate with the hours that you're charging them. But it's also really, really useful to be able to see where your time is going. So this is one of my challenges to you today. For the next week, when you're back in your office, track all your hours, even the ones that aren't billable. Where are you spending the most of your time? Is it on your craft? Is it on business stuff? Is it on email? And then ask yourself at the end of that week, where's there money to be made in this? Where can I save some time? What do I need to get more efficient at to be able to free yourself up to actually be able to make your time more profitable? Uh, there's some great tools out there. Find a tracker that works for you and use it. And the other thing that comes with this is that I'm sure there are a bunch of hours I haven't billed that I should have. It's easy to do a quick fix for a client and then think, oh, that 10 minutes, it's not worth worrying about. I'm not going to account for it. But it only takes six of those 10 minute blocks for you to have lost a whole hour of time or a whole hour of billing. So keep accountable, keep, a, keep an eye on it. Um, 
you know, can anyone afford to, you know, not bill an hour just for the sake of not tracking your time? So there are some other great tools and strategies for keeping focused. Uh, one of them is Pomodoro, where you put, set a timer for 25 minutes, focus for that period, and then give yourself a five minute break. You wanna know a secret? This is my five minute break. Um, sad but true, head down for 25 minutes in exchange for five minutes with my little dragons. <laughs> or Facebook, or odd socks, but you didn't hear that from me. There's a fine line with this one. When you're loving what you do, you can find yourself sneaking back into the office on Saturday to work a little bit more. That's awesome, I love the weekends, you don't get interrupted by clients, you can get a whole lot more done. But don't forget that taking a break gives you time to recharge. Don't forget your friends, don't forget to play in the middle of the work, and don't feel guilty when you do it. I don't know how many of us go, oh, I could be back in the office doing this thing, I'm gonna go out, I'm gonna do this thing, but I'm still feeling guilty that I'm not back in the office. Don't feel guilty about it. What are you working for if you're not actually having some time out and time to play? So then the next area that I wanted to focus on was talking about our well-being. Obviously there's your physical well-being, eating well, getting exercise, but you also have to look after your emotional well-being because freelancing and running your own business can be hard. So you need to have some structures in place to make sure that you don't lose your mind. Um, do you really need me to tell you this? If you're going to be sitting at a computer all day, there are a bunch of things you're going to have to do to look after your body. Exercise is a no-brainer. Keep moving. I usually try and get out for a walk. I have a 5K circuit that I do kind of three mornings a week. Um, I've been struggling with that since daylight savings. We're down in Melbourne. It's very dark in the morning. Uh, so now I get out for a shorter break or a shorter walk in my lunch break. And I'm actually getting to the point I'm looking forward to that downtime, get out. <laughs> get some fresh air, take a break from whatever I'm working on. Um, but it's, that kind of leads into this next point, which is have a decent workspace. If you're sitting at a computer all day, it's really, really easy to sit there with your head down and be looking at your computer. So set up your workspace to actually look after your body. Because you want to do this for the long term. You don't just want to do this a short term thing. So you have to be able to look after yourself for that. This is my dream chair. It's on my list top of the list at the moment actually. Um, if you're going to be sitting on your butt in front of a computer, do it for the long term and not spending a fortune on physio, chiro or osteo, get a good chair. And while you're there, get a good desk. Um, I'm looking at getting a standing desk, mostly because I do have really bad back problems because I haven't always done this. Um, and this was my big problem with co-working. I thought about co-working, but particularly going in part-time, they all have, it's all the sketchy cast off chairs and I'm like, I don't really want to sit in that for all day, so I'm quite happy working at home in my office with my decent setup. Let your yes mean yes. Let your no mean no. If you don't know, say so. If you need time, say so. Don't overcommit. Don't answer your phone after hours. Better still have a landline or a Skype number and give clients that. If you're clearing email after hours after hours, use Boomerang or a tool that will actually send those emails during office hours. Uh, clients will take as much as you give them and if they know that you never stop working, they will exploit that. So set those boundaries and keep them strong. When you're working at what you love, it's really, really easy to get captivated by it. We're nerds, we get passionate, this is just a heads up, you're much more effective when you're living a balanced life so don't let the work keep the rest of your life out of balance. So this was the big lesson. This is this whole chapter is the big lesson for me, looking after your business. When you're in business for yourself, it's easy to forget you're in business. For some, this is awesome. For another part, it's a challenge of building income and revenue by yourself. For others, it's a millstone around your neck and the thing which stops freelancing feel free. Um, Guess which one I am? I'm the latter. I never wanted to be in business, I just wanted to code on my own terms. So you have a choice as a freelancer, embrace the business side of things or contract someone to do it. I don't think anyone knows the meaning of the word hell until they've left 12 months worth of bookkeeping until the end of the financial year. And you have to balance 12 bank statements in one week. 
In the end, the only way I was ever going to be able to deal with bookkeeping was to pay someone to do it, and it's the best money I spend to make money in my business. For the price of two and a half of my billable hours a month, someone else saves me a week's worth of tearing out my hair, if not more. And for me, that's worth every penny. I hate it. God, it's horrible. <laughs> oh, much rather write codes and look at accounts. Okay, you've heard this before, you know that it's true, and it's bloody hard to do. Set up a bank account for your tax and transfer 25% of all your payments into that account. Now, even though I knew I was supposed to be doing this, it wasn't until I had a separate account that it actually began to work. Believe me, you don't want to be that girl sitting in the airport having a conversation with the tax department, making a payment plan to pay off the outstanding tax because apart from anything else, it's bloody hard to be setting aside your tax for every payment, let alone having to find an extra 600 bucks a month to pay the tax man what you owe him from the year before, or <coughs> the year before that. <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing that people don't always know that they can do is get connected with online access to your tax accounts. Then you can see what's owed and what's not and there's no big surprises when it comes to tax time. It's not that hard to do, jump online, set yourself up, you can see your integrated client account which is where your GST payments and your pay as your go goes, you can see your income tax account which is where they go, hey this is what you owe us, and um, it gives you that feeling of being a lot more in control rather than them going, hey you moved, we couldn't find you, you owe us all this money. So yeah, we're on much better terms now than we used to be. <laughs> I don't design. Uh, there's a good reason for this. There are people who are way better at it than me. And so I'll contract them to do that. This frees me up to work what I'm best at. Uh, realistically, I could learn. I could sit down and spend hours of learning and doing things I'm not great at. The bookkeeping is, of course, a case in point. But the fact is, I'll never be great at it. So I'm better getting better at the stuff that I'm good at and letting somebody else play to their strengths and do the good stuff. So for me, finding someone who's strong at design and letting them shine is way better than me doing a mediocre job. So identify your strengths and work to them and give other people the opportunity to work to theirs. Business ebbs and flows. Christmas, New Year, January are notoriously tricky months and as hard, again, as hard as it is, bear in mind that freelancing can be feast or famine. So in those early months, learn to live cheap. Keep money aside for the lean times and when you're in the thick of a gig, don't forget to keep an eye on what's coming next because you get so busy that you go, oh yeah, this is going to keep me going for another couple of months, but what's going to happen at the end of that period? So you have to always be thinking ahead. I know it's easier said than done, but it's important. <coughs> when you're thinking about building your own business, it's important to know who you are. Know what you bring to the table. There are skills you have, parts of this business that you love, that you can do really well. Hone those. Network in those parts of the community and serve the people who need help in the areas that you're strong on or that you're interested in or that fit your niche. I got into Genesis. I learnt it well. I spent ages in those early days working in the forums, making great connections. I taught a whole lot there, but I learnt so much more. And as a consequence, I'm well connected with the people who own that software and have been an amazingly help to me and to my business. I work well with and have made more friends with a number of customers who like me and who want to work with me and they tell their friends about me too. And when people want to work with me, they will see the value that I bring to their project and they will pay what I ask because they want to work with me and you have that same power. Make those connections, get strong at what you're doing. And what I charge them depends on what I believe I'm worth. So get that revelation. You are worth way more than you think you are um, and play to that. Find out what makes you special. Focus on what will make people want to work with you and trust that and build your business on that instead of trying to compete with all the other people in this market and at what they're good at. Finally, you're winning this one already. You go to WordCamps or conferences. Connect up with people in your field. Uh, my first conference was WordCamp Melbourne in 2011 and I sat in the back, barely spoke to anyone, freaked out at how many awesome people were making a business out of this open source and free software and I was really intimidated. <laughs> so I started going to meetups. So go to meetups. 
Now, some of the people I've met at these events have become some of my greatest friends, and it's crazy weird that we're all essentially competitors, but we work together, we help each other out, we refer work, we contract each other to work with us, and it's awesome. Keep up with the news and developments within your community. So this is freelancing not just for devs or for WordPress heads, but for copywriters or any of those other kind of businesses that you could freelance in. Get interested in what else is going on. Learn new things, experiment, get creative. Read the industry news and blogs. Keep up to date with what's happening. Listen to podcasts. Do courses. Skill up. This technology market is constantly changing and we have to keep ahead of it to keep up. So keep learning and bringing what you learn into your business and into your community. Uh, it will increase what you can offer and it will increase what you can charge. Find a forum or group or community of people who do what you do, who walk solo and connect with them. There's a huge number of places con to connect up with other users, other freelancers, other developers. I have Skype conversations that are pretty much going all day. The team that I'm working with communicate in Slack and there's a WordPress user community in Slack. If you haven't come across that, check that out. I'm sure the guys will put up a link at some point about how to connect with us, the WordPress community, in that, in that forum. Uh, there's great networks of people connecting in Facebook and on Twitter. There's websites like Flying Solo, which can help and resource you and others to work alone. So even though I work at home by myself for the most part, I never feel like I'm really alone. This is a connected world that we're in, and it's perfect su for supporting and working for yourself. So find your community, connect there. It will help in so many more ways than just keeping you outside your work home bubble. Uh, other people have challenged me enormously in my business, have taught me a boatload about not only WordPress but about business and productivity. So take every opportunity to connect and learn from each other. But above all, uh, enjoy the freelancing ride. I found that the benefits far outweigh the challenges and that's something that I never really expected to find. And in whatever stage you're in, I hope that you're loving it. I hope you find the bits of the process that are causing you stress and figure out how to mediate those so that you can continue to love it and enjoy it for the long term. And if you get stuck, reach out. Someone may have an idea to help you. Someone may have a job to help you work with them on or an opportunity that you might otherwise have missed. It's one of the things I love about this community. And that's it. So now, now you get to ask me all those curly questions and um, I'll do what I can to answer and uh, we'll see how we go. Run, run, run. Hi. Hi. Just, um, if you could go back in time when you started freelancing and you could tell yourself one bit of information that would make a whole experience better, what would Pay your tax. <laughs> <laughs> That was the biggest pain point ever. Because you feel like such a criminal. I felt like such a criminal. I'm a, I'm a do the right thing kind of girl. And, and, and to have the tax department finally find me and go, hey, D. I mean, I was never criminal, but it was like, yeah. <laughs> that one. Where am I standing? Am I standing in there? I feel like I'm feeding back everywhere. There was one over here. Yeah. But we're moving into either free camp or robot What do you use and what are the advantages of So did you say base camp? <laughs> yeah. Project management software? Um, I use Asana personally uh, for my client work. So that's a project management software and it integrates with Toggle, which is the time tracking software that I use. So they work together. Asana is basically a fancy pants to do list, really, um, with correspond, you know, so it might not be full featured enough for an agency. I don't know, I haven't used it at that kind of level. But um, the company that I'm working with at the moment uses Jira and all of those Atlassian products. So all of our project management happens and tickets were raised in Jira. And then we're using Stash and all of those kinds of things to commit and store code. So, I mean, you could do a whole talk on productivity and business tools. Um, I mean, I've got a few. I'm sure there's a bunch of people in the room that have a whole lot of others. There's one up here. Right, um, time tracking. I'm, yes. I'm terrible at it, but I'm not shooting better. Yeah. Toggle. Toggle. Did you have any other general tips or something just to, just to do 
you just have to do it. And it's actually like with the toggle stuff that we're doing, because I'm working full time at the moment, and so, so I, have to, I have to be able to log an eight hour day. And it doesn't matter when I do those eight hours, but it's actually really useful to be like, oh, that's what I did this morning. I mean, I'll, I won't lie, there's some times when I go back and go, what did I do at 11 o'clock from 11? It's just kind of retrofitting some of it. But yeah, toggle's a web based thing, it's got apps for all your phone and your, you know, your Mac and all of that kind of stuff. I mean, there's so many out there. Find the ones that integrate with the tools that you use. I use Zero for my accounting. Toggle actually integrates with that, so I can actually time track into Zero and then just raise an invoice based on those hours. So that's really helpful as well. You just have to find what works with you. You just have to do it. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hi. Um, hi. I've started doing a few odd furniture shops here and there, mm -hmm. set up the tax and all that. Yeah. The main issue I have, I guess, coming with you is I'm working on a project that is going well, filling it fine. I yeah. don't know, you know, multi hours and it's great. If I get a snack, I get a problem that takes me, I don't know how long it's going to take to get around to it. Yeah. And I start to feel guilty about filling that time. Yeah. How do you deal with you get a major snag and you're going around circles and the hours are. Communicate with your client. Yeah. Keep uh, keep it open and that's one of the biggest things is keep open and transparent. Clients will be incredibly forgiving if they know what's going on. But if you hit them with a bill at the end of that period and go, hey, well there's an extra seven hours because we hit the snag and they didn't know it was coming, that's when you start to get a disconnect between your relationship with you and your client. So when you, I, I, in those, I don't do hourly rate billing so much these days. I'm doing value-based pricing or, or contract rates. And, um, when I was doing it, I would say to the client, look, this is the estimate, this is what the quote is for, this is your 50 up front or your, your 30 up front, um, and this is where we're going to get to that point. You've budgeted $1,000 for this job, okay, so when we get to about 800 or if, I'll keep you up to date with what's going on. How can I make that feedback stop? It's making me crazy. Sorry, um, so just keep communicating with them, it's, because if you say, well look, this thing didn't happen, and the other thing is too, don't always feel like you have to solve those problems yourself. Actually ask people and go, hey, I've hit this thing, because you can actually halve the amount of time that it takes you to figure something out if you actually just get the hive mind onto some of those. So get connected in Slack with these guys, or you know, jump onto Stack Exchange and ask some of those questions. Don't always feel like you have to be the one to solve that problem. I've had a few phone conversations with people who call me up and going, ha, ah, D, panic, I've spent eight hours on this and it's not working, and it's like, well, let's do this. Click, 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 click. Why didn't I call you eight hours ago, you know? So, kind of work on that as well. Thank you. Um, I have a recommendation for a time Great. Um, Hash? Hash board. Hash board. Right. Yeah. 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 Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's definitely very good advice. Get contracts. Hello. Hi. Just with tax, it sounds like you did with tax crisis. Um, did you educate yourself? Was it easier to just like hand the whole tax problem to an accountant or did you educate yourself? Like, did, did, did the accountant tell you what to do or did you educate yourself like, through the tax office? Like, where did you get the information to uh, in the future? And, um, yeah, the tax office website, and but most of the time I'm like, I don't want to deal with this crap. You do it. That's what my bookkeeper's for. Um, and I, you know, I called my accountant recently and said, hey, I'm doing this work now. I, a lot more of my income is coming from one source. Is this gonna? So I asked my accountant. I'm like, I'm paying them money, so I'm making them work for it. So 
uh, it's a smart move, and I've got lots of friends who are a lot smarter about this stuff than me. I'm like, care factor zero, I just want to know that I'm covered. I don't want to have to learn about all of this stuff. Again, I, I'm a freelancer, web developer, I don't actually really want to own a business. Is that weird? It's, a, it's true, it's like, oh, shh. Tracy gave me the e-myth, I don't know, and very early on when we you know, met a few years ago when we were organising a WordCamp and I read that book and I hated every minute of it. And it was one of the best things that ever happened it was because I'm like, okay, I have to wear the business hat and then I have to wear the marketing hat and now I want, but all I want to do is wear my tech hat and write code. I just want to write code, but you can't. And so things like the bookkeeping and the tech stuff, it's like, your problem. Just make me look really good at the end of the year and make it not cost too much money. How are we going for time, guys? Are we all right? Oh, cool, cool. Ah, yeah. Okay. So somebody, I was at the Drupal conference early in the year and just had this casual conversation with this person who goes, yeah, yeah, I connected up with the Web Industry Association and I bought my insurance through them. So when I took this contract on with XWP, the guys I'm working with at the moment, they're like, okay, so we need you to have professional indemnity insurance as well as product and business liability, I can't remember what the actual word of it is. And so I already had the liability insurance because I used to do training and I had to provide my own insurance for that. But I'm like, where do you go for professional indemnity insurance? It's basically the insurance that says if our business gets damaged by what you're doing, we could come after you. And so I've got $10 million worth of insurance. It's like, great. So here's a tip. The Web in Australian Web Industry Association, AWIA, you pay 50 bucks to join up with them and then you can get professional indemnity insurance through them for a much cheaper rate than you would if you were going direct. So I pay 875 for my year and I've got 10 million of PI and 10 million of PL. Now that's just, that's not business for my, because I work from home, all of that is covered on my household insurance. So my only business insurance is that but I do have income protection insurance. That's another thing I should probably have put in there. Because if you're working for yourself and something terrible happens and then you've got no means of earning an income, just having that safety net of knowing, and I got mine through my health insurer, knowing that there's $3,000 a month available for me for two years to actually get me through the hump like that, that is invaluable. So again, that was another one of those small things that I put in there to go look after your income and make sure that's covered, particularly if you've got things like mortgages and all that kind of stuff. Super, yes. Yes, I'm just hitting that point now where I've got, I've got money that I can put into super now, and so I haven't had to contribute, because they don't force you to do that when you're freelancing, but if you can do that, that's brilliant. It's a very smart move. BizCover is also really good for insurance. BizCover? Great. We should, have, we should have a forum, like, for goodness sake, sign up to the Slack thing, let's put in a forum. Here, here's the tips that I've learned in my business, and actually have some of those conversations, it'd be great. Hi. Thank you. Uh, You're welcome. Great presentation. Um, how do you deal with the little things that uh, come in? Um, I get I get emails every day about uh, you know how do I do this or you know I just put a domain name and should I get a dot com and I'm finding that uh, a lot of my clients that I've done work for in the past um, they might just send me an email to say oh how do you do this or um, and I'm finding myself getting distracted and you know, spending probably a good five minutes answering that little question. And then and when you've day, done that for 20 people, there goes another hour of billable time. Yeah, so how do you deal with that? So depending on my relationship with the client, if I've got a maintenance client who's paying me a regular fee every month, I'm like, I'm happy to answer those questions. If I've got someone who's not paying for me for that, I would say, um, if I was really passive aggressive, I'd send them, let me Google that for you, but I don't want to ruin the relationship. So, <laughs> so I'll say something, you know, I'll say, look, I'm happy to help. Would you like to schedule an hour of pick my brains time and charge them for an hour? And some of them will go, oh. So you, you're trying to repeal back a boundary that you've kind of crossed before. So um, the other thing, I used to pick Jafe's brains a fair bit back in the early days when I'm like doing little bits of code and I've like, um, help! And, and I like, 
I'm always acutely aware that like, I don't want to be cutting into somebody else's productive time, but he said, his boundary for me was, I'll give you half an hour if it's going over that, then you can pay me. And I'm like, I'm hit to that. And I think, pretty sure I never actually paid you, did I? I always managed to keep it under <laughs> half an hour. <laughs> so just decide what your boundaries are. And if, it, and if it means having to go to your clients and say, hey guys, I'm finding a lot of stuff that's happening here. How about we get on a maintenance plan? Pay me, pay me 100 bucks, 160 bucks a month. And then you can ask me all the questions you want because... You know, I, my, with my maintenance plans, I give them two hours a month. Nobody ever uses it, but they've, they've got that safety net in the back of their head that goes, okay, so if we do need a little bit of tweaking here, we can get Dee to do it, and I'm happy to. Because it's that whole thing Troy was talking about, recurring income. So set the boundary. And if you have to communicate new boundaries, just, just do it. People will be, should be. And the other thing is, don't always answer the email every time it comes in. Okay, it's nine o'clock, I'm gonna spend 30 minutes on email, right? Then come back to it at midday, okay? So that you're not always answering every email that comes in as it comes in, because you get so distracted. Set aside times for that, schedule that. And have, oh, here's the other thing, have canned responses. If you've got stuff like that, if you've got a, an email question that you're asking all the time, have a bunch of links to other people go, hey, yeah, here's my response to, hey, I've got email issues, or what's my domain name? Oh, here's a link off to, here's a page that tells you about that. So you, you're not losing that connection. You've still got relationship with them, but you're not having to do all of the work. You. You're welcome. I ben. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, that's in the contract. It's available there if you want to use it. It doesn't roll over. So I'm not going to end up in a case where I've got somebody who I potentially owe 75 hours to. I'm like, there's no way that's sustainable. But I, I'm, and I've got some people that will push that boundary and use it. I've got other people who don't. They're like, we just know that we've got D in the background. If anything happens, we can ask her to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or what you already know about the client and how much pain they've already caused you in the past, and whether you have to add the 25% pain tax as well. <laughs> I've got one of those. I tell you what, and, and th th it's worth it. <laughs> one more. Hi. Thank you. Yeah, I, I use FreshBooks. Yes. I, just, I know a lot of people use Xero, and I just wondered why, what am I missing out on? That's a, a, a bigger bill. That, that's the first thing. Um, I was a FreshBooks user, and I migrated to Xero. Xero was, a, for me, FreshBooks is great for invoicing, and for a long time I was using FreshBooks just for my invoicing, and then everything would go to Xero for all of the bookkeeping. I didn't find... Um, FreshBooks very easy to manage in terms of expenses and all of that kind of stuff. I'm used to my ob and so I had the list of accounts. So I mean I do know what I'm talking about with the bookkeeping and stuff, I just hate it. So zero, I mean it connects to my bank account so my bank account feeds come right into that. So balancing the, the accounts at the end of the month is really, really easy. I mean there's lots of things that uh, FreshBooks does better. FreshBooks will remind clients Zero doesn't do that at the moment, and I didn't know this. So I'm sitting there going, there's all these unpaid bills. What the hell is there unpaid bills? Normally, you get an email goes out after two weeks, another email goes out two weeks after that. Zero doesn't do that unless you pay for a third-party client that will actually do that for you. They keep saying it's coming. So, um, but yeah, having to, so now I have to manually go in and do statements at the end of the week and go, oh, for God's sake, just pay me, you know? Um, I don't actually say that. But, yeah. I mean, I'm on zero because that's what my bookkeeper set up and my fee for her includes it. And that's obviously what she likes to use. Yeah. So it's kind of, it's, that, it's the next level. For me, it was the next level thing. Okay, so I'm going up a level here. I'm paying a couple of hundred bucks for a month for a, for a bookkeeper. And this is what that, and I feel like it's a more professional approach. But there's a bunch of people around here who are still using FreshBooks. I'm sure they'd be. Yeah, the other cool thing about zero is that it actually calls your bank fees yeah. your bank. And you can just basically, if you've got your invoices in there, it's all matched and you just click OK 
Yeah. And it will pull in Stripe and PayPal as well. Yeah. So I've got all of so all of the money that's coming in and going out all comes into one place, and then it's very very easy to tick all of those boxes. Again, I don't have to do that. In fact, they tell me not to. D, don't touch. <laughs> Worth every penny. Thanks. Cool. So let's give D another round of applause.